as we open up God's word together and as we ask God to open our hearts, uh, join me in a brief word of prayer. Father, what we know not, teach us. And what we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. For your son's sake, amen. The theme of our text this morning, and our text is Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 4 through 7, but really all of 1 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And the theme of our text is fatherly discipline. Like the the verse of that last song that we sang, that God guides our ways with his fatherly hand, that a loving father disciplines his children. And so just before we read our text, permit me two brief stories from my own life of fatherly discipline. It was about eight o'clock at night. The kids were young and we were actually getting the kids ready for bed. And there was a banging on the back sliding glass door of our house. And I walked back there and it was the father from the house our backyard connected with and he was angry. I opened up the sliding glass door and he is in my face screaming at me. And the deal was that our sons, they were about eight years old, maybe had been playing together earlier that day and they had done something wrong and I had disciplined them. I didn't touch my neighbor's kid. I didn't touch his shoulder. I certainly didn't spank him. Uh, But I just, like I do, admonished them strongly and exhorted them about what's the right thing and what's the wrong thing and why not to do the wrong thing. Well, this dad took exception to that and he came over to let me know that I could never, ever, ever talk to his son like that again. The second story is one of my kids was maybe 15 and uh, he asked if he could go to a movie. I looked up the movie and I said, no, you can't go to that movie. Oh, he was so mad at me. He was disappointed in me. You know, dad, I'm disappointed in you. And he was mad at me. And uh, as, you know, young lawyer-oriented kids do, he was arguing with me that it was okay. And so, of course, like maybe your kids have done, he mentioned another Christian family, his friend, his, his friend that he wants to go to this movie with. They, that family is a Christian family, and his parents don't care if he goes to that movie. So, God, so, 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 Dad, why can't I go to that movie? And I tried to explain to my son because without throwing that other family under the bus, I just tried to explain, you know, my convictions that for us, this is, this is the line and this is the conviction. And he was so disappointed with me. And through the years, his voice has kind of echoed in my mind. Well, Dad, you know, he, he, he named his friend. Well, Dad, his parents don't care. His parents don't care. Our text today is Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to focus on verses 4 through 7. Let's read it starting in verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have all had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? 
For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later, later, later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So as we look at this text together, I want to show you that sonship and suffering, that the, the greatest love of God and the gravest difficulties in the children of God, that they go together. Uh, as we meditate on this text together, um, I guess the best way to tackle it is to give you, you know, kind of an overall understanding of it. So the first thing to talk about is that this text reveals our core identity, and our core identity is there in verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father has not disciplined? As far as I meditate on this text, uh, everything flows into and out of verse 7. Everything flows into and out of verse 7, and the idea identity of being a son of God. God is treating you as sons. If we have hard discipline in our life and we don't understand it, the way to understand it is to understand our identity that we are sons of God. We don't talk enough about the privilege of adoption, that we are adopted as sons of God. J.I. Packer in his wonderful book, Knowing God, says the privilege of adoption is the highest privilege in the Christian life. And we've been adopted as sons of God. You understand, sisters in the congregation, that every one of you is adopted as a son of God. You understand, brothers in the congregation, that every one of you is the bride of Christ. I don't know about gender inclusive language. I guess sometimes it's helpful. But the biblical category of a son and the biblical category of a bride is meant to apply to both sexes in the congregation, that we're adopted as sons. What it meant to be adopted as a son is it meant to be a full co inheritor of the Father's blessings, of the Father's treasures, of the Father's estate. The glorious doctrine of adoption, our core identity, is that we're sons whom the Father loves. So as we see that, then this text explains to us a main disconnect, a main disconnect, and that is the disconnect between what God is doing, how God is treating us, and how we understand that. Look at verses six and seven. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. What the Lord does in our lives, his providential leadership in our lives, his fatherly discipline in our lives, what God does reveals his character. What's happening in our lives is our circumstances. There's a hard discipline in our life, and so there's a hard circumstance in my life. And the disconnect is when I read my circumstances in a way that misunderstands or misaligns God's character. This text says, if your circumstances are difficult because of fatherly discipline, don't misread that as if your father doesn't love you or doesn't care for you or is against you. It's actually the other way around. The main point here is that we grow weary or faint-hearted, verse 3, grow weary or faint-hearted, in verse 3, we grow weary or faint-hearted, when we despise or neglect, verse 5, we regard lightly the discipline of God because we have confusion and doubt about who God is and what he's doing in our lives. That's the main disconnect here. The main danger, I guess I'd show you that from verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. The main danger is that you'll grow weary or faint-hearted. This is what will happen. You'll grow weary or faint-hearted, verse 3, if you, verse 5, have forgotten 
Or verses 6 and 7, you've made that disconnect and you've forgotten God's character and your circumstances have made you doubt God's character. That's the main danger is that your circumstances make you doubt God's character and that makes you grow weary or faint-hearted. Then you treat God's discipline lightly and you quit resisting sin. You see verse 4 says, uh, verse 4 says, in your struggle against sin, resist it. Well, if I'm doubting God's character and I'm weary, I'm not going to be able to resist sin from a standpoint of strength because I doubt God's love and I don't have an enduring faith. So don't make the main disconnect between your circumstances and God's character. Don't fall into the main danger of growing weary because you've forgotten God's word. Instead, remember your core identity that you're a son of God and remember, the main attitude and action focus of this text, that's the next thing to show you just by way of an overall understanding. The main attitude and action focus of this text is there in verse 3. Consider him and don't grow weary. And it's there in verse 7. It is for discipline that you must endure. Endure by considering Jesus. The focus of this text is still faith. Faith was the focus of Hebrews chapter 11. And then faith continues as the focus in Hebrews chapter 12. It says in verse one, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. To run with endurance is the focus. And to run with endurance, you need an enduring faith. To run with endurance, you need an enduring faith. And what Hebrews chapter 12, specifically verses 3 through 11 is saying, is it's still emphasizing faith and endurance, but it's in that specific circumstance, that excruciating crucible of fatherly discipline. Because it is precisely when fatherly discipline begins to strain and stress our lives that our faith is either shown to endure or our faith cracks and falters and falls apart. Faith is still the focus, but it's a faith that endures through fatherly discipline. This section is framed by the end of verse 3, don't grow weary or faint-hearted, and the beginning of verse 12, therefore lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. This passage is meant to give you fortitude, endurance. It's a warning against growing faint-hearted. That Greek word for faint-hearted was used of a runner who collapsed and didn't finish the race. Don't do that. Instead, endure the discipline. Endure the discipline. Trust your father and see that verse 11, it will yield righteousness. It will yield peaceful fruit. So seeing all of that lets us see how this passage does one big turnaround like often the Bible does. And I love, 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 love it when the Bible does this. The Bible takes what you're feeling and thinking and shatters it to replace it with what you should be thinking and feeling. It's a big turnaround and it flips the, it, it flips the mental script in our mind. When we undergo hardship, we doubt God's love for us. When I undergo hardship, I doubt God's love. I'm tempted to doubt God's love for me. But this text says, if there is no hardship in your life, that might show that God has no special love as a son and a father for you. When we have hardship in our life, we doubt God's special love for us. But this text says, if there's no fatherly discipline in your life, maybe then you should doubt God's special saving love for you. We doubt his love over the hardship. This text flips that around. By reflecting on the divine intention in discipline, this text is meant to make you understand this. When I'm disciplined, I'm not being abandoned by God. Rather, I'm being noticed by God. When I'm being disciplined, I'm not being abandoned by God. I'm being wanted by God. When I'm being disciplined, I'm not being let go by God. I'm being loved and drawn back by God. It's the reverse of what you naturally feel. 
And we need this kind of reversal. Listen, listen, you need this kind of reversal because you forget. Verse five, verse five, and have you forgotten? I want to tell you, I, I didn't count them up exactly, but like every epistle, it's like, have you forgotten? Do you remember? I tell you again. I remind you of these things. Every epistle in the New Testament emphasizes forgetting, remembering, and every Bible teacher in the New Testament seems at one point or another to say something like, I know I've told you all this before, but I have to tell you this again because you have forgotten. You've forgotten. See what happens in verse 5 when we forget God's exhortations and the fact of our adoption, when we forget the facts of our faith. Watch this. When we forget the facts of our faith, our feelings take over. And we begin to reason wrongly about our righteous God. When we forget the facts of our faith, our feelings take over. I'm a, uh, I'm a ordained minister of the gospel. I'm a pastor. I'm not a psychologist. I am an expository preacher, meaning that I spend hours every week digging into God's word. And I, I may be wrong about this, but it's my opinion that being an expository preacher makes me better at human psychology than any psychologist who's been trained in secular principles of psychology because this word reveals the inner workings of the human heart. And I want to tell you, as a pastor, how many, many, many times I've pastored others, how many times in reflection in my journal I've had to almost pastor my own heart and reflect that I'm in the spot that I'm in because feelings and seemings, feelings and seemings have dominated my life. And feelings and seemings have dominated my life because I have forgotten the facts of the attributes of my glorious God and the gospel by which he has adopted me and the facts of the promises that he's given me in his word. So don't forget. Don't let your feelings take over. Let this guide you. I'm telling you, this text, and this won't be our only week in it, Lord willing, we'll, we'll look at it next week, maybe even the week after as well, try to discern the difference between fatherly discipline and, uh, you know, like the, the justice of God in hell, which are two different things, and talk about more aspects of this. But I tell you, this will help you. One proverb, you don't have to turn there, but just listen. It's, uh, some verses in the Bible will break your heart. This verse... Proverbs 18, 14, listen to this. Proverbs 18, 14. A man's spirit can endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. Proverbs 18, 14 says that your spirit can endure sickness. You could get into an accident and lose an arm. You could be sick and have to go through some hard process and lose all your hair and, 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 and vomit continually and have a hard time physically. A man's spirit can endure sickness of the body, but a crushed spirit who can bear. You feel like you have a crushed spirit? You feel like you know someone who's in danger of having a crushed spirit? I'm telling you, this text is the remedy because when we misalign God's character and we misunderstand the circumstances in our lives, and we have a crushed spirit because we doubt the loving hand of our Heavenly Father. A crushed spirit, who can recover from that? This text may save you from shipwreck, from doubt that spirals into despair and abandonment. So get it right and remember it. Remember it, verse five, do not forget. Verse five, do not forget. This is the key, your endurance in faith requires the grip of God's love for you. Your endurance in faith requires your continued assurance that God loves you. And if every time there's hardship in your life, you doubt God's love for you, I don't see how your spirit could endure. 
Your endurance requires your assurance that you belong to God and that he loves you. And so one of the things this text is telling you is that the fatherly discipline in your life is God loving you. It's God caring about you. It's God caring about your prosperity in the future. It's God caring about your safety in the present. It's evidence of belonging in the father's family. The son that is without discipline is an illegitimate son. It's evidence of a family belonging and of fatherly love. So to live the Christian life and have an unbroken spirit, an uncrushed spirit, you need to understand that the highest privileges and the hardest disciplines go together. That's the way it is. Those things don't seem to go together. If God gave us a vote, we may say we don't want those things to go together, but they go together. Divine sonship and the suffering of discipline. Divine sonship and the suffering of discipline are not contradictions. They actually belong together. And I want to take more than one week on this because I think it's hard for us to see. And I certainly admit it is hard for us to feel. It may, you may have to battle you may have to battle to see and feel this. You may have to fight that battle for 10 years, but I want to tell you, keep fighting it. It's worth it. Divine sonship and the suffering of discipline. Just a small aside, because personally I'm fascinated by these things, the rhetorical structure of the book of Hebrews, if you remember, it was a while ago, in Hebrews chapter 2, we had all these lessons about how Jesus, as God's son, suffered. And there's this rhetorical patterning. It's, it's mind-blowing that in, the, in that sort of indicative portion, gospel portion of how Jesus, as God's son, suffered in chapter 2 is now mirrored here in chapter 12 that those who are in Jesus, specifically as God's sons, they suffer. Divine sonship and the suffering of discipline. So this is the, 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 I, this just hopefully gives you a core understanding of the key themes that are here. Now, all the rest of what I want to give you this morning is just four encouragements for you based on this understanding of this precious paragraph of Scripture. Four encouragements for you. Encouragement number one. This is it. In order to endure, look to Jesus who, in, who has already endured for you. In order to endure... Look to Jesus who already has endured for you. In order to endure, look to Jesus who has already endured for you. That's why it says in verse 1 of chapter 12, lay aside the weight, lay aside the sin, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We have to run with endurance. And then it says in verse 2, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. I'm telling you this morning to look to Jesus. And this is, I don't know if I'm going to have a happier instant in my day as I will have right now. When I'm telling you to look to Jesus, I am telling you to look to that which is the most beautiful object to which you can ever look. When I'm telling you to look to Jesus, I am telling you to look to that which will satisfy you more than anything you could ever dream of. Jesus is the pinnacle of perfection. Therefore, Jesus should have the preeminence in our meditation. He's the one to whom we look. Bible says when we get to heaven, we will see him with our redeemed eyes in our glorified bodies, visually, ocularly, we will see him and we will be conformed to him. That's what's going to happen then. The Bible says what happens now is that we're constantly, constantly, constantly trying to see him with the eyes of our hearts, with the meditations of our faith, so that we can be slowly but surely conformed to him even now. In order to endure, look to Jesus 
And specifically what we see is that he endured the cross. Verse 2 says, let us run with endurance. Then you have the same word endure in verse 2. It says, look to Jesus. Verse 1 says, we have to run with endurance the race before us. Verse 2 says, we look to Jesus who endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. This tells us a couple of things. One, Jesus walked the path of suffering. He knows what it's like. Jesus, the Son of God, was not free from the suffering that comes to the sons of God. Uh, and another thing that this shows us is that now Jesus has endured the cross and that he is ascended into heaven. It says there he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's not a throwaway uh, line there. What that says is the cross worked. When it says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, what that says is the cross worked. Justification satisfied. Eternal life purchased. Security sealed. The cross worked. And now when we look to Jesus, we're not only looking to a bloody Savior dying for us on the cross, we're looking to a risen Savior who said to us, when I get to heaven, that is the guarantee that where I am, you shall be also. Don't let a year or a decade or eight of them make you doubt that where he is, you shall be also. Look to him. Look to him. In order to endure, look to Jesus who has already endured for you. A second encouragement, a second encouragement to you, and this is from verse four. A second encouragement to you, verse four says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So my second encouragement to you would be this. Keep killing sin and annihilating bad attitudes. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep killing sin and annihilating bad attitudes. Don't stop. Even if the battle's bloody, even if you get tired, even if someone else who seems to be more highly regarded in the church doesn't battle sin as hard as you do, forget that's them. That's them. Leave it alone. Keep killing sin and annihilating bad attitudes. To live the Christian life, we have to keep killing sins. And, and, and we have to keep receiving the Father's discipline in our lives. Verse 4 has got to be one of the most bracing statements in this epistle. You see what it says there? It's kind of shocking. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So let's pop this into our circumstance. So you leave here and you go into your ABF. And you have a sin struggle in your life and... They all share prayer requests. Well, you don't want to share your sin struggle with 50 people in the ABF, but you have a friend in your ABF who's at your table or whatever, they, you know, and uh, you're, you're eating Kringle, and you just say to your friend, this is a sin that was really tempting me and that I was uh, struggling with last week. You're looking for a little encouragement, and your friend says to you, well, have you fought it so hard that you died fighting it? Um, no. How encouraging is that? It's, it's actually very encouraging because look at, how the, look, at how the, look at how the question is framed. Have you, uh, look, at, look at how the very question is framed. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of dying yet, have you? Th this question is phrased so that no one can answer the question yes. If you haven't yet resisted your sin to the point that resisting your sin has killed you, then you can't answer Yes. Nobody can answer this question who's not already dead. I just think the point of the question is that the Christian life is such a fight of faith that it will never be over until we're in glory. So just uh, strap on your helmet. It's, it's not going to stop. There's no halftime. Don't be surprised. Don't be discouraged when the battle keeps going. Be prepared to keep fighting it. Be prepared to keep fighting all the way to the end. Look to Jesus who has already endured for you. Keep killing sin and annihilating evil attitudes day after day after day until you die. A third exhortation. This is the heart of it. Remember your father loves you 
and you can trust his disciplining hand. This is the core exhortation. Remember your father loves you and you can trust his disciplining hand. Verses six in heaven, six and seven. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Remember your father loves you and you can trust his disciplining hand. We are so often discouraged in our experience of God's providential discipline. But God's providential discipline is not meant to discourage you. To be very legally accurate here, God's fatherly discipline is meant to discourage you to sin. But God's fatherly discipline is not meant to discourage you about him and the fact that he's your father. It's meant to to prove and validate and, and, and actually bubble up your heart with affection that you have a dad who would love you in this way. It is his method of love. Old pastors used to say, faith kisses the hand of her striking Lord. Can you? Have you? Kiss the hand that wields the rod. In other words, the very hand that spanks you is the hand that loves you. And again, maybe next week or the week after, I'm not saying every hardship in your life is God spanking you for sin. We'll talk next week or the week after maybe about some discernment there. I'm not saying every bad thing that has happened to you is, is God disciplining you. Some suffering is just the man is born of trouble as the sparks fly upward. Some suffering is just the result of the fall. But in this instance, it's fatherly discipline. It is his rod. And it's easy for us to say that the hand that strikes you is the hand that loves you. It's hard to come to believe that. It's very difficult to come to feel that, but that's the fight of faith and it's worth it. It's worth it, my friends. It's worth it. Keep at it. The best illustration here is John Newton's poem titled These Inward Trials. Just, if I remember, I'll put it up on RBC's Facebook or whatever, but you can look it up. John Newton's poem, These Inward Trials. The poem begins with a prayer that we should all pray. The poem begins with John Newton saying, God, you are holy. I am yours. I want to be holy. This is how John Newton begins his poem. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith, in love, in every grace, that I might more of his salvation know and more earnestly seek his face. That's a great Christian prayer request. And the the way the poem goes is John Newton's like, this is a great prayer request. God, you want me to pray this, so now just hook me up. Be be good to me and, and answer this prayer. Oh, God answers his prayer, all right. Listen to what he says next. I hoped that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. I think the same way. God, I'm praying the right thing. And so since I'm praying the right thing, you're going to give me rest. God doesn't think that way. Here's how the poem uh, concludes. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evil of my heart. And he let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yes, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. He crossed the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will you pursue this worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answered prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free, to break your schemes of earthly joy that you may find your all in me. John Newton says, God, that was the right prayer to pray. So why did it make my life harder? It seems like if I made a godly request, you'd just answer it with cotton candy. And God says, these inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free, to break your schemes of earthly joy. You may find your all in me. The point is that we should learn to, to, to trust 
our Father's loving hand of discipline. And then a fourth and final exhortation. And we'll try to explain more about this next week. It comes from verses 10 and 11. It comes from verses 10 and 11, and the exhortation is this. Go all the way through the discipline and gain the promised benefit. Go all the way through the divinely ordained discipline and gain the promised benefit. Go all the way through and gain the promised benefit. This is a text about endurance. And that's why it says in verse 10, they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful and if in the moment you fail to endure, you'll never lead to, later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. Discipline to what end? It says in verse 10 that he disciplines us for our good. But but maybe my favorite phrase there is the very end of verse 10. I I think maybe there's nothing more beautiful in this text than the end of verse 10. It is so beautiful to me. It doesn't just say that you may behave. It doesn't just say that I may put a star on your chart, that I may not have to swat you anymore. Look at what it says. That end of verse 10, that we may share his holiness. And I love that the ESV doesn't even put the, put the preposition in, not just that we, but that we may share his holiness, this relational belonging, more, more intimate and more spiritually close than I could ever be with my kids as an earthly dad. We share in his holiness. Why was that other dad so mad that he almost broke the glass on my, on my rear door? Maybe because I was an idiot, but I don't want to take that explanation. I think it was because he was saying, well, I don't want my son to turn out like you. You don't have the right to shape and guide my son. He's not your son. He's my son. I want him to turn out like me. Why did I tell my older teenage son, you, you can't go to that movie. Because I, I was trying to get him to share my values, the beauty of holiness, the, the wonder of sexual integrity only within the bond of marriage. I want him to share those values and convictions because they're beautiful, because they'll make life sweet, but because they're a, they're a part of God's holiness. If God has called you his son, then it is his design that you share in his holiness, that you become like him. And so he's, he's, he, he, this is what he's doing in your life. Man, this is game, set, match. This is Genesis to Revelation. Revelation, we will see him and we'll be made like him because we'll see him as he is. What did the serpent say in Genesis? He says to Eve and Adam, the first son of God, he says to them, if you want to be as God, disobey God. This text says, if you want to be as God, if you want to share in his holiness, then let him as your father guide you into greater obedience through his fatherly hand of loving discipline so that you can be conformed to the beauty of his holiness, so you can be embraced by a father more than any earthly father could embrace his son, so that you can share in love, family love, the love that created the universe, the love that predates the universe, so that you can share in that love. This is what the Father is about as he lovingly disciplines you. This is his method of love. Let's pray. Father, what we don't know or didn't know, you have now shown us and taught us by your word. What we don't have, enduring faith, 
sanctified life. These things that we don't have yet as we want, grant them to us now through the remembering of your word. And so God, as we ask the very words of this text, that we may share in your holiness. Give us faith. Let us see and be transformed by your fatherly love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord give you such faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ that you leave here with the assurance that he has loved you and he has washed your sins away. Amen.